Today, on the Terrible Warriors, we return to Gen Con! We're not done with that convention just yet. For you see, while I was on the floor of Gen Con, walking around, getting to meet people, checking out new tables, I got a text. I got a text from one of our own, telling me, you have to go to this table right now. If you can find them, have a look at their book, check out the artwork, I think you're gonna like it. And you know what? They were right. I was sucked into the world, this evocative art. Images of soldiers in gas masks, some warped and monstrous, others hiding in the trenches as horrors lurk around the corners. I had to meet the person who made this game. I needed to learn more about this game. And that's when I got to meet Matthew Orr. Matthew Orr is the founder of Wet Ink Games, and he is the creator of Never Going Home. What is this game? Well, why don't you return with me to the floor of Gen Con, and I'll let Matthew Orr, the creator of Never Going Home, explain to us just what this game is. So what it is, is a role-playing game that is set in World War I, and we've added a veneer as if the problems of World War I were not bad enough. We've added a veneer of dark fantasy or horror aspects to it. So the idea being that the veil between worlds has been torn open by the the death and the destruction of the war and so the others who live on the other side of the veil are able to notice humanity and they want to corrupt humanity and they're whispering through the veil to corrupt humanity and you can accept that in the game and become a dark wizard and command the undead or you can say like no that's we don't want this on earth and we're going to fight against that so you're the characters in the game who are fighting against that, who are trying to hold on to their humanity yes. despite the chaos of this desperate, desperate, desperate situation. World War One wasn't already senseless enough with, uh, exactly. with its loss of life. And... Right. Uh, and that's the, the whole, the whole <laughs> yeah. starting point. And that's actually, I'll tell you, the starting point. So the game comes from the art itself. You mentioned the art being a, being an evocative thing. The art actually started the game because we have a, a guy that we'd worked with before, a friend that we knew. His name is Charles Ferguson Avery. He did... I don't remember the year, but it's been a few years ago. He did for Inktober. If you've ever heard done Inktober, or if you ever know what Inktober I've is, heard of it? Yeah. Yeah. So the idea is an artist will draw in ink for thirty days. Yeah, one, sort of one a, drawing like a, every day. Like those, uh, was it No Rimo or Nano or, or, or uh, uh, the uh, the RPG the a day every day April and that kind of yeah, thing. Well, exactly. Kind of exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Inktober is a thing an artist do, and this is what he did for Inktober. He was like, I've got this wild hair about like. Eldritch horror in the trenches. I'm going to draw dead bodies. I'm going to draw putrescence. I'm going to draw gas masks. Every, yeah, everybody yeah. has a gas mask on because the humanity is lost. Every you don't see faces in the entire book. You only see gas masks because humanity is out the window. It's like this is a a situation that drains you yeah, of your humanity. It's such a striking choice because you're so without even having eye contact and faces of your own characters. The, quote, heroes of your story, yeah, yeah. and that even they remain faceless yeah, in, right. throughout the book. Yeah, it's just sort of so, lost. And so, since we know Charles, we're like, Charles, what is this? Can we do something with this? And he's like, yes, please do something with this. So we did. We made a role-playing game. We started with the art, and so we, what is this game? Well, let's, let's develop, why is there this darkness? Why is there these monsters? What is this guy with the staff and the like candles on his his pith helmet? The like, antlers coming. Yeah, out of antlers that. coming yeah. out of him. Like, what are these things? Like, so we put stats to that, put a purpose behind it, and so then we said, now we need more art for the covers, for the extra monsters. We need more. The, we need more. We need more. And uh, so then he, so some of the game is inspired by the art. But then we had more art inspired by the game, so it's and sort it of become became this cycle. Right, it's become this whole thing. Yeah, it reminds me a little. We played Tales in the Loop this last year, okay. and Tales in the Loop started as an art coffee table book, and it was it was the same deal as the art was being made. The company that was printing the art also did role playing games, and was like, we've got to take this. We've got to move this somewhere else. Yeah. But it's uh, it's not. I'm the, the art comes first into the story. I love that. I love that. I love that idea. And, 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 and it's one of the reasons why we wanted to put the art front and center. Like it's, it's all Charles's art. We've worked with artists before where we put a team of artists together to do a project. 
but this one is it's all Charles's it seems art. Seems to inform the whole layout of the book, and uh, from the you've also got these journal entries that work their way through, and that like, keeps drawing you back into the imageries. Uh, right, and, and, and it's just and and the the, the writers that we had, the writing team that we had, the one person uh, her name's Sarah or Aiden, she that's my sister. And uh, it's it's a kind of a family company still. Oh, like sure. it's my sister's one of the writers, my brother in law, her husband, one of the is the other co writer, co developer of our company, co co owner of the company. So it's kind of all in house there. That's and, awesome. Uh, it is awesome. Yeah. Like you know, we've been writing as writing partners and partners in the in partners in crime, so to speak, in the industry for a little while. And this project is like, you know, Sarah. We know you are going to be able to write this because. This is one of the things that she's read all the books yeah. about the setting. So when we're like, do some fiction, do some like character studies about writing letters home. And what is that going to sound like as this guy loses his mind? It does feel very and, rooted in the history. Like uh, yeah. I, I was just reading a bit about the Battle of the Somme and that being like one of those moments when the veil was yeah, that's, sundered. That's when we took that's over there. Yeah. That's the moment. And 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 yet it's also uh, you know in 1916 almost taking the imagery of the first bomb uh, uh but yeah. 30 years before what yeah happened. that one image and, of the, and, the, and the, the the great light on the horizon yeah. or whatever when and, the veil was torn and just the, and and the confusion and the horror and everything coming out of that but mm -hmm. also like rooting it in those very real historical moments and then going further uh, so how uh, it was a successful kickstarter uh, it was how, successful how is it, kickstarter how has the production how has the journey been Oh, it's yeah. been it's been oh, no, pretty crazy. Question. Well, it's not a loaded question. <laughs> uh, what the problem? What I like to say is that every problem that we've had has been a good problem to have. Yeah. The Kickstarter was bigger than we expected. We got just to give you a uh, we we set when we had the Kickstarter. I believe our goal was seven thousand, ten thousand, something like that. I can't remember the number, but it's it's been. We said, like, we won't go much over that, so we're going to put every $1,000, we're going to get another writer on to write another adventure for the uh -oh. game. So then we ended up with several thousand dollars being kickstarted, which ultimately meant that we have, the game is, I, it's 31 adventures total is the number that we have in the four different products. So that's 27 different writers that we wrote with all hands in the industry. I noticed that when I was going and to the back end of the book and everything is a different author writing there's a each lot, adventure. It, each, uh, a whole slew, a whole bevy of different writers uh, did all the different adventures. It's a great problem to have that your Kickstarter was so big that now you have to do a lot of unexpected work. Sure. That's a great problem to have. So uh, we promised that we would have it at Gen Con and here it is at Gen Con. Um, we sent it to, we sent the digital versions to backers the day before Gen Con, so they do get it first, yep. but then when we get home from Gen Con, that's where we're going to start fulfilling the, the products. This is the reason I found out about it was you sent that out before Gen Con, and the word came back, and I came to your table, yeah. and uh, so another cycle for you fulfilled. Right. How is that, having that many different writers writing your adventures, for me as a player, it feels like I'm going to get this really diverse experience and, and uh, all these different ideas coming at you because you've got so many different people putting something up. But yeah. for you on your end, what's it been like having so much, I want to say suggestion or input or interaction with your, because uh, even before the game goes out into the wild and you would get all that reaction it, in the play, you've already got so many people being able to interact with your well, with your world. Yeah, I, I think the the best thing that came out of it as far as that goes is that because we've worked with so many people, like the best ideas could then be passed on to the other people that were working on the project. And somebody got really excited about the Alps and was really researching the, the, the Alpine campaigns between Italy and Austria-Hungary and really went in depth on that. So then I learned all that because he had been interested in it. So then other people sure. that did stuff in the Alps, I could pass information. And you don't I have learned. to be an expert on everything now. No, because there, and everybody was doing their own things, but it all kind of added together and yeah you mentioned different perspectives like we've got dungeon crawl style adventures we've got run and gun style adventures we've got investigation style adventures we've got there's not like a who done it but there's definitely ones that focus more on espionage and keeping covert and other ones are just like they're coming how long can you stand up against the the onslaught you know it's like a, a constant wave of combat so all of those modes can be played in the game and that comes from 
it, it's been proven that it can be done because the different riders win in those different directions. I mean, and there was a little touch on the actual experience in the game. One of my favorite bits when you were, when you were selling it to me yesterday was the uh, the deck of cards and your connection to your humanity. Yeah. Uh, do you want to go a little bit into that? I know sure, you, I don't sure. want to overwhelm anyone right. with too uh, much, but so, I'd like to focus on the setting. But yeah. It's a really interesting and there's always a, when we were at the table and you were telling me there was this moment where the pool table was kind of like, oh no <laughs> <laughs> so the mechanics come mostly from my writing partner Brandon Ayton and he's a co-owner with me of Wedding Games that's our company but he did most of the mechanics so I'll give him the credit for this but the idea is that the cards you're gonna there's two parts to the mechanics of the game you've got dice you're rolling dice to get successful five and five and six is a success you need a certain number of successes to do the thing you're trying to do. So that's the dice mechanics. Then the card mechanics are, they can do lots of things. Your cards let you heal. They give you those bonuses on the dice so that you can be more successful with the dice. The cards also sometimes need to be used narratively. At the beginning of each mission, you have a little narrative thing. You have to put in a card. There's just a whole slew of things that the... There's a lot the, of really good reasons the, you need to use you, these cards. You need to use the cards to play the game, but that's mechanics. Narratively, the cards are your humanity. You're hanging on to your humanity as desperately as you can because everything around you is encouraging you, the whispers that are in your mind from the others, the deadly situation, the fact that you can push yourself just a little bit more to get that success. They, they, you're being pushed to give up your humanity to live one more day, but then is it worth living one more day if you've lost all of your memories from your childhood and your what bird song sounds like and stuff like that? You know, is that is that worth the risk? You you know, that's the pressure of the game and the tension in the in the play is I can push myself, but then I, what am I giving up to to do that? This is heartbreaking victory. <laughs> Fearic victories all around. Fearic yeah. victories all around. With never going home, Matthew, I want to learn a little more about you and like right. and wedding games is a is, is a thing here it's, and yeah it, it's seeming to be a thing. So how did how did you get to being here and doing this and making a game? You're at Gen Con now talking to me like it does in, feel a little surreal. <laughs> but yeah, what's it? Uh, how did you get started? What, what what's the origin story here for for your character? I mean, for myself, I don't know. I don't know where I learned it from, but I knew people did role playing. So I went to a store and I bought the dice and I was like, what do I do with these? Like, I don't know. And I played some Japanese role playing game video games. And I was like, okay, well, I kind of know you got to have heroes and you got to have things. So like I got together with my friends in middle school and I was like, oh, we're going to do some stuff like there, roll this die and we'll just kind of do. It was completely free form, no rule set. <laughs> I was cribbing from a Fan, uh, not in it, square, square. So before, Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy. That's the words yeah. I was looking yeah, for. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I was scribbing from Final Fantasy. You know, um, you and Lucian Khan have the same origin. I, I if that's he, his origin, he, then I guess he, so. He played the very first, like the original Final Fantasy on the Nintendo, and he would write like elaborate backstories on these no backstory characters, uh, and uh, and and it was just this place that was a sandbox. So the, the next step for me after like wanting to role play and not really even knowing what it was, was meeting Brandon, who already knew he had the books, he had the dice. The master of the tome. He had, he had the master of all the tomes. <laughs> um, and so meeting him in middle school and then like we've been role playing together basically since then, not continuously, but off and on. It's like that's we're just always together. And he's he's Brandon Ayton has worked for Palladium Books, uh, written a lot of stuff for them. So then my first publication in the industry was then with Palladium Books because I had that connection through Brandon and, you know, we've, we've just been developing things together for other companies. And then we thought, well, we should, if we're developing stuff together anyway, we should develop stuff together for ourselves. So then we launched our first project in our brains. We did some play testing. We developed some stuff. Then we've. And we've just really gone from success to success. And then the rest was history. And it, well, I don't know if it's history yet, but <laughs> but it just it it it, it, it the, the momentum began to yeah. kick on and off. Wedding Games founded in uh, 2015, and we've we've had this is our second game line. I think we have six books now. Uh, our first game was a 1930s Sky Pirates, but you're all animals uh, setting. We have one expansion book for that, and then Never Going Home launches with three expansion books so that's a total of just on cover alone and hearing uh, a little talk that you had at the table it did 
it trigger my memories of after the bomb, which in mentioning Palladium, there's I was like, oh yeah, I went and that was one of the first games I got to play when I was in uh, high school with, with some of my friends. But set in a completely different era, you're not mutants. You are right. You're just always been human. They're, they're never humans. They're not. Yeah. They're not mutants. But yeah, it does. Uh, you know the the whole TMNT thing is very much in the DNA of Wild Skies. So we can't can't deny that. No, yeah, it was just it was just for me it was just this it, it evoked that memory of it. There was yeah. like, oh, cool, that's kind of neat. And uh, what's next for Matthew? Where like I know like right now your life must be consumed by never going home. Uh, it does feel that way. It does feel that way. <laughs> making this, uh, making what we've accomplished with wedding games so far to be a going concern that kind of supports itself. Like we have done. There's best practices in the industry. Like we've done our, our products through Kickstarter, which is pre-funding. You're you're drawing on your support of a fan base, and the to have the money where you can release a product where you have enough capital built up, where you can release a product without having to tell them all about it first. Where you can kind of work. You have the a, more security that you can yeah. develop a product and then like, hey guys, here it is. It's ready now rather than asking for the money up front and then having to deliver on the promises you made. And, and then you're spending half your time also being saying, hang tight, hang tight, hang tight. Right? I don't know about half the time, <laughs> but uh, you know, th- there is that pressure to, to meet the expectations that we promised in the beginning. And I think we've done it with this product. But, and it's not that we don't want the support of our fans from the beginning. It's just that a company that has the room to take more risks and do more products at the same time rather than you're not going to want to kickstart every three, four months. It's a different kind of pressure. It's a different kind of thing. And we want to get big enough that we have that. And we're, we're really doing that. I talked about all the different writers we worked with on never going home. That was like our auditions for like, these are the people we want to work with next. And we have a number of products lined up. Yeah. You got this epic roster. We have an epic roster of people that we've uh, in good standing with that we are really ready to work with. They've come to us to say like, Hey, I've got a game. So we're doing that. I think our big Gen Con announcement is that I think we're scheduled for an... Uh, no, it's August now. I think October is when we're doing our next Kickstarter. And it's for another historical setting, but ro- end of the Roman era. Ooh. So you're going to be Romans facing off against the barbarians. And you're trying to... It uses the same mechanics as Never Going Home. Uh, but it's going to be tweaked in a little bit a uh, little bit different ways. And uh, it's... a uh, Again, one artist, and he actually is writing it too. So Stephen Wu is a writer and uh, artist, and he'll be putting together that whole book, and we're just doing all the production stuff for it. The art is fantastic. It looks like Romans. It looks like the the stuff, and that's Tenebria. So uh, look for that in a few months' time. And that's, Tenebria, yeah, no, that's our biggest thing that is on the horizon, the closest thing on the horizon. But we've got excellent. lots of products in the works. Very cool, very cool. I did want to ask uh, throughout all this. Why tabletop role-playing games? If you want to write, you could write. If you want to be an artist, you could be an artist. If you wanted to uh, get into gaming, you could get into indie video gaming. Uh, what, what is it here? Like We're at Gen Con, there's like a million people. But what is it about tabletop role-playing that is driving you to now you know, put out a game, put out another game, launch another game, build this roster, have a company? And what brings you back to it? So I just walked out of a, a four-hour session of playing this game with five people, never seen them before. I may never see them again, but that four hours that we shared together at a table was a, an amazing experience of collaboration in the storytelling. Like I brought my game, I told them how to play the rules, but then once they were into the rules, everything else came from them, what they wanted to do, how they felt about things, how they taught about, how they, how they reacted to the situations that I was presenting. It was a collaborative, world-building, storytelling process with you know, strangers that are, I could see in tomorrow and say, like, hey, I remember you, and shake their hand. You know, it's that you don't get from reading a novel. You're not going to sit down with Neil Gaiman and create the story together unless you're very lucky. You know? You're not going to like, go up to Larry Elmore and tell him, like, oh, I think you missed a spot. You, know? like, you don't get a collaborative effect when you read a comic or you look at a movie but when you play a role playing game it's completely collaborative you are building a world together and you never know what you're going to experience you the game sets limits to some extent but you can go off on unexpected tangents 
you can't pl- that that you as a play as a leader of the game, you can't plan for an, for a great idea that a player has. So what's that like for you now? Like I'm sure never going home now, having the, it be out and available and being play tested, and, and what's it like having a, a world you've created and writers you've worked with, and then it going into the hands of someone else to have that collaborative experience? Is oh, it's it, great. Is it because terrifying? Is it rewarding? Is it no, a little it's bit of all completely that? rewarding what's because. You know, I've had this experience and I got to play it with some people and it was great. But then I see people, those people followed me back to the booth to buy the book because they wanted to have that experience with other people. Yeah. It's very much a feeling of like, I'm spreading this, this the, the excitement that people feel about the stories they can tell at their own tables is great to feel that, that like, hey, I made something, I helped make something that other people are taking, that are, other people are super excited about and they're going to take away and introduce to their friends who are going to be have those experiences. Is there, a, is there a moment when you've been playing Never Coming Home that really surprised you with other players that they took it in a direction perhaps that you and 28 other writers weren't able to anticipate? Um, I don't know that it's that's happened exactly. Um, or just or a memorable left turn or something that's just like, yeah. that would have been like, so, oh, like that kind of emergent thing that comes from that. Yeah, so part of the Part of the game is about this access of corruption, the, the whispers. You can hear the whispers of the others. Are you going to succumb to them or not? And one of the characters that, one of the players that I was just playing with, he said that he was kind of playing into that in a very subtle way. He made a big bruiser type character, good at melee, can really take some hits. And there was a, <laughs> I don't want to necessarily spoil all the events, but there was a reason why he had to hide in a pile of corpses. And it, the, corp, the pile of corpses happened to be on a train. So we, I, I was asking him to describe, like, the experience of going on the train ride. And he was like, I think, like, I've got this weight on top of me. I, oh I've got the train rhythm moving. I think it's the best sleep that I've gotten. Like a weighted blanket. It's like a weighted blanket. <laughs> I think it's the best sleep that I've had in months. And, you know, like, he brought that. That's what I'm talking about. Like, yeah. he brought that. And we're all like, oh, that's so beautifully macabre. Yeah. Because that's 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 what it is. Like you might that's a logical conclusion. If you're on a train full of bodies, you're hiding underneath them because you're trying to sneak in somewhere, you might fall asleep and have a really good sleep. Get your rest going. Matthew, where can we find you to keep in touch with your games and with your development? Well, where can we yeah. find you to There's follow up? There's three main places. The first would be we have a Facebook page, Wedding Games. You go like that. You'll get all the news from us. It'll have a link out to our other... We do have a YouTube page where we have some tutorials for our first game. We're going to be putting up some tutorials for Never Going Home there as well. You can also go to the Never Going Home Kickstarter page. It's still there. It still has the art on it. It still has the information. You can learn about it there. And all of our products are on Drive-Thru RPG. If you're a digital person or you want to get that print-on-demand, like... Drive through RPG, all our products are there. Click into the episode details to be able to find the links to all of those things in there because I do that for you because I want you to follow these people because they're very cool and their creations are so interesting. And I want to thank you, Matthew, for spending time with me here yeah, away great. from your day. Uh, you're going to want to get back to your booth now. Enjoy the rest of your Gen Con. Thank you so much. Thank you. To follow more of what Matthew Orr is up to, be sure to check out Wet Ink Games on Facebook. Now, we also mentioned there's a Kickstarter page, there's a drive-thru RPG page, there's also that new game that's going to be kickstarting in October. The links to all of those things are available in the episode details. So open up your phone screen, click details, you'll see the linkity-doos. And uh, they're also posted over at TerribleWarriors.com where you can follow through with all of the interviews I have been doing at Gen Con and Breakout Con. And next week, we will be talking with one more maker before we return to our actual play format. His name is Brandon Conway. And he's one of the and he's one of the founders at Magpie Games. He's one of the creators behind Masks, and he's passionate and fascinated by Powered by the Apocalypse games and storytelling and finding new ways to tell those stories. And in September, Magpie Games will be starting another Kickstarter campaign of their own for Root, the tabletop RPG. And next week, when we talk with Brandon, We're going to learn all about Root before we go in to play it ourselves. 
follow us on Twitter at Dice Warriors so you can be in the know about our happenings. This whole show is only possible because of the support we get through listeners like you at patreon.com slash terrible warriors. Becoming a supporter of the show gains access to debrief episodes, postcards sent in the mail, as well as higher up the ladder, you can join us in monthly private games where you will get to join in on the planning stages of the games that we play here on the show. Thank you for listening. Next week, one more Meet the Maker with Brendan Conway at Magpie Games. As we talk about Root, the tabletop RPG, because in two weeks, we're playing that game to help promote their Kickstarter. It's super cool. And we'll see you there, right here, next week, on the Terrible Warriors. <laughs>